So before I get started, guys, uh, just to get an idea of who you are, so I can try and target it to you know, your your interests, your needs. Who here considers themselves a developer? Who here considers themselves a site builder? Well, okay, so more on the developer end. Um, who would say they're a beginner? Intermediate? Advanced? Okay, sweet. Yeah, this is uh, definitely geared more towards uh, beginners, people getting started, people aren't familiar with the idea of distributions. And uh, who here has um, actually tried Monopoly in the past? A couple of people. Cool. Cool. So, my name is David Selbeck. I am a freelance Drupal developer. Um, I'm also one of the co maintainers of Monopoly and 20 ish or so other projects on Drupal.org. I also co organize the Drupal Meetup in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So, if you are in Wisconsin or near Wisconsin, I invite you to come join us. Uh, we have the best food at any meetup ever. The uh, lead organizer, he home cooks just like tons of food and brings it to every meetup. Uh, Len can attest. Absolutely telling the truth. That's why I'm so thin. <laughs> <laughs> so if you just want to, you know, uh, get up to Milwaukee and have a good meal, it's worth it just for that. So we've been at mid-camp all day talking about Drupal. Uh, what are some of the types of sites that you can build with Drupal? White House Park. <laughs> so government uh, uh, portals, what else? University. University websites. Blogs. Personal blog, yeah. yeah. I got a couple of those on here. E-commerce store, uh, internal collaboration tools, social networking sites, making your own YouTube. Really, the possibilities are unlimited. I'm not really aware of a type of site that you couldn't build with Drupal. I mean, there's other concerns that sometimes make other platforms more viable, but like for the most part, I'm just, I don't know any class of site. But what does Drupal give you out of the box when you install it? Who here has installed Drupal 7? Or at least seen what it looks like immediately after install? Yeah, so if you haven't seen it, uh, you get this blue thing uh, which is sort of a simple blog with a not very good content editing experience. The thing is, nobody really wants this thing. When you're, you know, hoping and dreaming about your new website, you're not thinking of this. You know, this does not meet any client requirements document ever. You couldn't take this live. You know, it's basically a blank slate. And it's up to you to, you know, go through the 24,000 Drupal modules on Drupal.org find the ones you need, install them, and configure them. And that's the power of Drupal, right? All those modules, there's anything you want to do, there's a module for it. You can do amazing things without writing code and just installing modules, but that work is up to you. What most people actually want is something that kind of feels like a website. Uh, this screenshot is from Open Public. It's a Drupal distribution for building websites for local governments. And when you install it, you get a website for local governments with demo data. If you went through here and just replaced like my example city with the actual name of your local government, you could go live with that in a matter of hours. People want the core functionality that they need for their site. Uh, this screenshot is from Commerce Kickstart. When you install Commerce Kickstart, you get a full e-commerce store with product catalogs, checkout, shopping cart, all that stuff. It's built on Drupal Commerce, which is a fleet of Drupal modules for making you know, infinitely flexible e-commerce systems, not just you know, stores with products. But you know, it's so much easier to install something and modify it to what you need, rather than starting from scratch and building it up, at least for when you're getting started. You know, if you're already an expert in Drupal Commerce, that story would be a little bit different. In short, people want something as close as possible to their end goal out of the box. You know, if you're launching an e-commerce store, you want to be thinking about the products that you're going to be offering, the deals you're going to be doing, not implementing basic shopping cart functionality. If you're launching a personal blog, you want to be thinking about the articles you're going to be writing, not basic, you know, comments and WYSIWYG and all that stuff. You want to focus on the unique value proposition of your site. And if you work at an organization with dozens of sites, or uh, you're a freelance Drupal site builder, or work at an agency and you're building sites every day, 
you know, there's probably some configuration that you do on every new site. You know, wouldn't it be great if Drupal just came that way when you installed it? So this is where Drupal distributions come in. Uh, who here is familiar with the idea of Drupal distribution? A couple of people. Who's actually installed a Drupal distribution anyway? Cool. Uh, so the, for those who don't know, a Drupal distribution is basically Drupal prepackaged with a bunch of contrib modules uh, and themes, and when you install it, it comes up with some purpose. Uh, installs just like Drupal, uh, but it does something. And th the great thing is it still is Drupal. So if the distribution does X, but you really need X plus Y, you can still dig into that pool of 24,000 Drupal modules add what you need, customize it, change it. Uh, here are some popular open source distributions. We already talked about Commerce Kickstart and Open Public. Uh, open Atrium, it's a distribution for internal collaboration. So have discussions within departments, assign tasks to each other, have a shared calendar. Uh, Drupal Commons, if you want to make an online community, have your own Facebook. Uh, Open Academy, University Department websites, uh, Julio, school and high school websites, Demo Framework, uh, Brentwin isn't here right now, but he's at the event, he's the maintainer of the Demo Framework. Anyway, this is a really interesting case. Demo Framework is a distribution that Acquia made as a sales tool. When they go to a new client and try to sell them on the idea of using Drupal, they don't show up with Drupal 7 out of the box. They take this distribution instead which has you know, a whole bunch of the common uh, modules that uh, people would enable, the sort of things you would see on a fully built out Drupal site. Purple for internal project management and uh, customer relationship management. So if you had a Drupal agency, you wanted to manage all of your internal projects uh, using a Drupal site, you could. And Panoply, which is going to be the main topic of today's presentation. Um, so those were some public open source distributions that anybody can download. Uh, there's also lots of people who have made internal uh, distributions. Here are a couple of big examples, but you know who knows how many other people have made internal distributions just to make their lives easier. Um, you know they're under no obligation to, to let us know. And you know these are some big names, but even small to medium sized organizations can benefit from having an internal distribution. As a freelance developer, I've created any sort of distributions for a number of small organizations. So here are some of the reasons that you might want to create one. Um, if you're a Drupal shop, you know, you don't make completely unique websites every time. You probably operate in some niche. So you know, you can make an internal distribution that does that same sort of configuration you do every time to come up on its own. Uh, if you have lots of sites, oh yeah? What's the difference between that if you just show them a thing? Um, so, a theme that's like you can take all of the functionality of a Drupal site and like switch the way it looks. And most distributions include a theme, right? But a distribution is like you install Drupal and it already has all these modules installed, it already has them configured in a particular way, it already has your theme set up. So it's like a build out of a site, but it happens automatically on the install. So like uh, in, in this case, you know, if you have a lot of sites or you know that you're going to be launching new sites all the time, you can put the stuff that you want on every new site into a distribution and when it comes time to create a new site, you just launch a new one of those. It comes out of the box with everything you need. So an alternative to making a distribution um, would be just copying sites, right? Like if you make one site, and then you're about to launch a second site, and you're like, oh, that has you know, most of the features we need, so we'll copy it, we'll clone it, and then make changes. You know, now you have these common pieces of functionality on both sites. If you want to change that common functionality, now you have to log into both sites and change it twice. Which might be workable for two sites, but not for 10 sites or 100 sites. So an advantage of using a distribution rather than cloning is you can actually make updates to the distribution itself and redeploy it to all of your sites, and they'll all get updated. So what is Panoply? Panoply is actually at least three different things, which makes it a little difficult to explain and certainly uh, more difficult for us to develop. Uh, one of those is it is a distribution itself. Um, you can download it off of Drupal.org, 
install it, and it's a starter distribution. It's a blank slate, just like uh, you know Drupal 7 is, but it's an improved blank slate. There's a whole bunch of usability improvements. We add things that a lot of people want, like WYSIWYG, uh, media support, responsive layouts, and then some panel stuff we'll talk about later. Uh, the other thing, and probably the more innovative thing, is that it's also a base distribution. Who here is familiar with the idea of a base theme? So, you know, what are some advantages of using a base theme rather than building a theme from scratch? Maybe you like me, you suck at design. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you suck at design and the base theme already is a little bit, you know, better. Some of the common markup that you're going to put in there, or some common CSS that's mm -hmm. already dealt with, and then you can build from it. Yeah, yeah, it already makes some decisions about approach, and maybe does some things that are sensible taking Drupal from it's a little bit outdated design to maybe a more modern style design. Yeah, being able to take advantage of this shared work. And the advantages of using base distribution are pretty much the same. You know, Panoply handles a whole lot of the low-level details sets up you know, this framework that you will put your specific additions into. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that uh, during the demo stage. Yeah? Uh, getting back to point one, mm -hmm. uh, to what extent is the added value of Panopoly going to be incorporated into Drupal 8? So a lot of the stuff that Panopoly adds is from Drupal 8. Um, so the, the theme that we install when you install Panoply is responsive bar tick. It's a backport of the default theme in Drupal 8. Uh, the toolbar module that Panoply installs is a backport of the toolbar module in Drupal 8. Uh, there will be WYSIWYG support in Drupal 8. We also have uh, WYSIWYG pre-configured. So, you know, Panoply for Drupal 8 will have less stuff in it. <laughs> I think there probably will still need to be a Panoply for Drupal 8, though. We'll see. Okay. And the third thing, who here is familiar with the features module? Who here has ever actually made a feature? Uh, so the features module allows you to take some of the stuff that you did in Drupal, like the point and click work that you do in the admin interface, and pull that into a custom module. And then you can enable that custom module on another site, and it will set up all that configuration. So it's a way of taking configuration and reusing it. Panoply is also a collection of about a dozen modules, features modules, uh, for each of the different pieces of functionality in Panoply. So we have a Panoply WYSIWYG module that does all of the WYSIWYG stuff in Panoply. And you can take any of those modules and put them on a normal Drupal 7 site. So it doesn't have to be Panoply. If you just want to take Panoply's WYSIWYG and use it on your vanilla Drupal 7 site, you can. Just grab that module, run its main file, install it. Uh, so, we'll see a whole lot more of this when we get to the demo portion, um, but I just want to go over some of the uh, user experience principles of Panoply, since user experience is one of the main drivers for Panoply. Um, you know, do the obvious things out of the box, like the things that everybody is already doing. So like, disable the overlay module, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, adding a filter box to the module of this page, I mean we can argue about which modules we should use to filter the modules page, but I think we all agree that that's better. You know, it's objectively better. Uh, replacing the admin content page with the one from admin views. I don't know anyone who prefers the, the stock one. So just all the basic stuff that everyone's already doing to improve their UX out of the box. Keeping uh, users and site managers on the front end rather than the back end. We don't want people digging through the admin interfaces of Drupal, changing something, not really knowing what it does, and then having to go back to the front end to actually see it. So editing things where they're displayed rather than on the back end. Keeping Drupalisms behind the scenes. So we try to make it so that any internet literate user would be able to understand the different concepts that they have to work with in order to customize their site. And that applies to users and site managers, right? If you're the site builder or you're a developer, you're still stuck with Drupalisms. But you know, you shouldn't need to know what a view is, a block is, a panel, in order to do the basic kind of customization that we want to allow users to do. Again, yeah, try to show previews, live previews, WYSIWYG, wherever possible, because you know, clients really respond to being able to see what they're doing rather than, 
you know, manipulating something in the back end, going like the admin structure blocks page and changing something there. Who knows what it does? You click save and nothing happens. So I added this slide kind of at the last minute, uh, but I wanted to get this out of the way right away because there are a lot of strong feelings about panels. Um, who here has used panels before? Who here loves panels? Who here hates panels? Who here has mixed feelings about panels? <laughs> cool. So uh, I used to be in the hating panels camp uh, because I'm a developer, right? And to me, panels is just another pointy, clicky thing. And I don't want to be using pointy, clicky things. I want to be running code. You know, and a lot of uh, users and site builders don't like panels because it's complicated. There's a whole bunch of new concepts you have to learn. There's a learning curve. The page manager, which is the default interface for working with panels, is really confusing. So it gets kind of a kind of a bad rap in the community. Uh, Panoply is what you know eventually uh, led me to love panels because it uses it in a very specific way. Um, we include not just panels, but the best of the panels ecosystem. So like a half dozen other modules that build on it, that extend it. If your only experience with panels is panels and the page manager, uh, what we're going to see in Panoply will not be familiar to you. It will be different. So yeah. panelizer, fillable panel pane, the panels IP, some of the extensions. Uh, and we try to hide all of the nasty things in panels from users, mainly the page manager. The golden rule is that users will never see the page manager. They'll use an alternate interface called the IP, which we'll see a whole lot of in the demo portion. And using panels in this way allows you to create really amazing experiences for your clients without necessarily writing code. Um, and if you're a site builder, you can use views, you can use fillable panel paints, which really just means entities and fields and create really cool new experiences, things specific to your client without doing any code, and there's also lots of stuff for developers too. All right, so let's start talking about some of the actual features of Monopoly. It'll be a mix of slides and live demo. So the first thing that Panoply does is it installs a whole bunch of contrib modules, super popular contrib modules. If you've you know, done any site building in the past, you probably recognize most of the models on this list, you know, views, path auto, jQuery updates, uh, module filter. Some of the ones you might not recognize are some of the middle ones that are panel stuff. Faith, it's another panels thing. It allows you to edit fields uh, like from a, a, a panel page. You get like a little context menu and you can click edit. Anyway. <laughs> right. So uh, it installs all these modules by default and keeps them up to date. So when a new version comes out, We'll test it, make sure it works with everything else, and make new releases of Panoply. Same for security releases. So any of the modules that Panoply installs, you no longer have to worry about them. You know, if there's patches to important bugs, we'll include them. If there's patches required to make them work together, we'll make sure those get in there. Uh, we'll manage some of the complex uh, conflicts, like the media module, uh, getting that to work with WYSIWYG could be hit or miss. You know, we make sure that the versions we include will all work together. So if you use Panoply, you don't have to worry about this. We got you. Layouts. So every website has to deal with layouts somehow. Uh, all websites use a couple of different layouts. Um, the traditional way to provide layouts in Drupal is through the theme system. But there's a whole bunch of other ways you can do it. Uh, you know, Context and blocks, panels, of course. Uh, Panoply uses panels. And through panels, uh, we provide you out of the box with all of these layouts. Uh, they're all responsive, cross-browser tested, they'll work in most themes, and uh, users can arbitrarily switch between them and move different pieces of content from region to region, all you know, WYSIWYG style in real time on the page that they're looking at. And I'll, I'll show you that right now. So this is a fresh install of Panoply 1.2. Uh, when you're doing the install, it gives you the option of installing the Panoply demo module, which puts all of this extra demo content on there. If you disable the Panoply demo module, it removes the content. So there's really no uh, harm in enabling it. Um, so 
So the panel's IP, which I've been talking about so much, adds these two buttons down here at the bottom. I'm going to click Change this layout. Uh, it gives me the same set of layouts you saw on my previous slide. Uh, this one selected. Let's switch to the sidebar on the left. We've gone from the sidebar on the right to the sidebar on the left. This page is already live. Done. Uh, users can move the different widgets to the different regions by clicking Customize this page. Let's grab this uh, demo content widget, put it in the sidebar. You'll notice that the uh, image was much bigger before. It's shrunk to fit the available space. If I move it back here, it gets bigger again. You have to sacrifice goats to get that to work. Sacrifice <coughs> goats. Well, looks like think he said. <laughs> the image uh, I, I missed the joke. The image resizing is that like using a different um, defined image so it's actually like no. not having to download the large image? No, uh, we don't it? have uh, real responsive images yet. We're talking about integrating the picture module, which is backported from Drupal 8. We haven't done it yet. Um, so here it's just resizing it. You know, it's loading the full image and resizing it based on the ratio. In the WYSIWYG, we do have a feature that will resize it on the server side. I'll, I'll show you that a little bit later. Yeah, so I clicked Save. This page is already live. Oh, and quickly, show you the responsive. Uh, hang on, I did that not quite how I wanted to. Okay, so you can see the menu items at the top have already become, you know, big uh, finger press buttons. It's like the tablet version. Actually, this looks exactly like the demo that uh, Larry did earlier because this is the exact same theme that's in Drupal 8. If we shrink it further, it'll eventually, oops, here's a bug in response to the meeting file <laughs> issue about. Anyway, uh, we resize it further, and it's dropped from a two column to a single column layout. We put the menu items back in there. And all of the uh, layouts that are included with Monopoly are responsive. Search. So the built-in Drupal search that comes with Drupal 7 Core was designed to run on as many platforms as possible, including like $5 a month posting. It wasn't designed to be especially featureful or especially performant. Uh, so Panoply replaces all the built-in Drupal search functionality with a suite of modules called Search API, um, which gives you, you know, faceted search out of the box. Uh, by default, it works off of the database search. Uh, but if you wanted to, if you had really uh, serious search requirements, it's easy to swap out the back end for Apache Solar, a real search engine. And like all things in Panoply, uh, this is in a specific feature module, the Panoply search module. So if you didn't want these search customizations, you could just disable the module. Or if you didn't want your distribution to include them, just don't put it in your distribution. Each of the uh, features come with their own make file. So like, if you don't include it in your distribution's make file, its dependencies won't even be downloaded. So it won't even get search API and all the stuff that needs to work. WYSIWYG. So whether or not WYSIWYG is actually a good idea, users love it. Users expect it, and it's going to be in core in Drupal 8. In Drupal 7, it's relatively easy to just like enable WYSIWYG so that it appears on your site, but there's a plethora of technical problems you you know encounter in practice. The first one is you know which of these buttons to give users. There's uh, like a hundred options. It's just clicking a checkbox to turn it on, but some of them are a terrible idea. Uh, for example, letting them change the font. You know your client will put everything in Comic Sans. It'll totally throw all of the work you put to designing the theme and choosing the fonts, just, just ruin the site. Uh, font size, you know, they'll make one line be 52 points, another line be 50 points, no consistency. Of course, you want them to use, you know, heading tags rather than font size anyway. So a whole bunch of thought needs to be put into restricting what buttons they have. But just because the button isn't there doesn't mean that they can't put it into the editor. If you copy and paste something from another website, or like Word or whatever, it will put it in the WYSIWYG, even if the button's not available. So you also have to set up all of these filter rules to remove the things that you don't want there. 
And beyond you know, filtering for control, you also have to filter for security. There's HTML, mainly uh, the iframe tag, the script tag that attackers can put in there to uh, you know, spy on your users or steal their personal information. And then you know, beyond that, there are a couple of things that users expect which aren't included in WYSIWYG out of the box, uh, which you need to download other modules and configure and set up. So um, we'll take a look at Panoply's WYSIWYG. So the first thing you'll notice, um, there's one row of buttons, just the simple things. And you click this one to get the more advanced things. You don't overwhelm them with a bazillion buttons. Uh, we'll try media, since that's one of the more difficult things to set up right in the Google. We'll go to add an image. That's an alt text. Uh, you're able to choose one of the image styles of the image that you want to insert. <coughs> so then here, uh, we use the image resize filter module, which allows you to uh, resize images in the WYSIWYG editor. And here, it will uh, serve you a resized image. It will resize it on the server side and then serve you that. Save that. If you have images, you've got to have image captions. This is another extension to the WYSIWYG. Float to the right. Uh, the particular module that we use for image captions allows you to continue to edit the caption in the WYSIWYG, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, not all of the caption modules for Drupal will allow you to do that. You know, some users have trouble with links like just going to a page, copying the URL and putting it in there. They don't know what a URL is. It totally throws them off. Uh, we include the link it module, which allows them to type some keywords. There's some pages I know that are on this site. Just pick one, click insert, links are done. So you know why set up WYSIWYG by scratch on each new site that you build when you can just you know, grab Panoply WYSIWYG and use it? Uh, while we're in here, let's take a look at the content editing experience. I'm going to jump to a new node. Yeah, and actually, like I was saying before, this toolbar module is um, the navbar module in Drupal 7, which is a backport of Drupal 8's toolbar module. So it uh, works great under mobile. It's way more accessible than any of the other toolbar modules out there. And it's what we're going to have in Drupal 8. So yeah. All right, uh, something that, that you just said, uh, what, instead of creating it from scratch, why not go and grab Monopoly WYSIWYG module? Mm -hmm. uh, if this is a, uh, a what did you call it? A, uh, distribution? A distribution, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just grab the Panoply WYSIWYG, or do you Absolutely. have to grab the whole distribution? No, you can, you can grab just the Panoply WYSIWYG module and enable it on any Drupal site. Uh, we've put a lot of work into making sure that there are no more dependencies between the modules than there have to be. There are some we could avoid, but for the most part, you can just grab one module or two modules and put them on your site. So there's like a module with admin improvements. Uh, there's a module uh, with oh, page okay. improvements. But there, there's a deployment that has all of them, or you could grab yep. the modules individually. Yep. So OK, all right, now I got it. Uh, well, feedback, I was saying, you know, it's a distribution that you could install as a blank slate, you know, as a replacement for Drupal 7. There's, like we're talking about, you know, modules that are independently useful, and then you can use it to build your own distribution. Those are the three primary use cases. OK. If you um, disable the WYSIWYG, which I know is strange, but if you do that, how much does it break? It'll just make sure you know it's fine. OK. Yeah. All right. Um, you, you mentioned several things that are like Drupal 8 in here. I was just curious, is it is this built upon that other version of Drupal where it's not Drupal 7, not Drupal 8? Are you thinking of Spark? What is it? Are you thinking of Spark? No. Oh, no. It's oh, you're thinking of Backdrop? That's exactly what I'm thinking. No. Uh, okay. This is built on standard Drupal 7. Okay. Um, I don't think the Backdrop code base is stable enough yet to build real things with it. Okay. You know, uh, we've been talking a ton about Drupal 8 today. Drupal 8 is still quite a ways out. You know, Drupal 7 at this moment in time is at like the height of its productivity. 
you could build more faster with Drupal 7 than you could like any time in its history. You know, Drupal 8, you're still looking at like a year or two before you can be productive. So Panoply gives you, you know, some bits of Drupal 8 today. I mean, you could use this in production, lots of people do. When Drupal 8 does happen, is it mm -hmm. going to be more or less difficult to change a site, to migrate a site from Panoply to Drupal 8? Um, compared to a Drupal 7 site that you've just added other modules to? I don't think it will be any more difficult. I mean, um, migrations from 7 to 8 are going to be a lot different than they have been in the past. Um, you know, there will be like, we won't have a version of Panoply as soon as Drupal 8 comes out, I don't think. Uh, there's still a whole lot of unsolved problems with like how panels is going to look in Drupal 8 and all this stuff. So you won't get like some of our customizations, but you totally could go from like Panoply in Drupal 7 to something in Drupal 8, and either you live without uh, you know, some of the customizations we do, or you choose an alternate approach, or help us port it to Drupal 8, that would be awesome. <laughs> So if you remember from the um, keynote, uh, the Drupal 8 node add page uh, goes into a similar two column layout like we have here. Who has never seen the Drupal 7 like create content page? So we've all seen that? Awesome, okay. So it goes from the one column thing to a two column here. Um, you know, we really try to uh, remove unimportant or confusing things to just get this page down to the bare minimum of what you need. Uh, for example, we don't have the promote to front page checkbox you know, under publishing options because that checkbox only ever actually works if you don't customize the front page, if you leave the default front page. But everybody customizes the default front page. So now all of your users for the rest of the time on your site are stuck with a useless checkbox just to confuse them, to throw them off. You know, maybe try it, but nothing happens. You're talking about the promote the home page? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You also disabled the, the make sticky. Yep, got rid of the, the sticky atop of lists. We've had times when we need to, un need to undisable it. Um, so what I would recommend if you wanted to make implement something like that would be to use the flag module. But you totally could undisable the sticky atop of lists if you wanted to. I think it's just about setting a variable. Um, you know, I don't think we have a variable for that. Um, if it's really important to you, you should totally make an issue, an issue queue, and we could add like a screen for it. Um, you could bring it back in a custom module if you wanted, because all it's doing is setting the access uh, attribute to false. Um, so it's like it's still there, we just don't see it. Um, this also, this particular customization is done by the Panoply add module. So if you thought this was stupid, you could just disable it and then, you know, use the rest of the stuff. Another checkbox we took away is the uh, published checkbox, uh, which makes sense to developers because it's a flag by Boolean on or off, but it confuses users. Instead, we replace it with the same draft module, which gives us a publish or same as draft button. Uh, what else did I want to say about this page? Ah, so uh, we put a lot of thought into adjusting the size and position of different elements on the page for importance. So, like the title. Is big and at the top, like the title should be. Um, below that, uh, you can see you know the URL that the page will appear at, which is still important. So it's at the top, but it's super tiny, so it doesn't distract. Um, and also, this page, the node add edit page uh, in Panoply, is a panel. So if you wanted to change the way this is, move things around, make it be three columns instead of two columns, you can totally customize that for your users, for your distribution. Um, so, landing pages. Uh, Drupal does an awesome job at content. You know, creating new content types, putting fields on them, creating a whole bunch of those. Like, that's Drupal's bread and butter. If we want to make a content type that represented presentation, you know, give it a title, give it a description, make a URL to the uh, slides, a uh, date field with the date and time, and then create 100 presentations and make some views and mash that all up. Like, Drupal rocks at that. What Drupal does less good at, uh, at least you know, out of the box with core, is unique one-off landing pages. And there's a couple of solutions for that. Contrib, um, you could maybe do it with 
uh, you know, beams and contacts or uh, panels is one of the solutions uh, to, you know, those landing pages. But normally in panels, to create those pages, you're still stuck with the page manager. And the golden rule is that users should never see that. It's way too hard, way too confusing. So Panoply has added a pseudo content type. Uh, it's not a real content type, but you still go to uh, the add content page and find it here. So users still use a workflow they're familiar with when they want to add a landing page. They go to the same place they go to to add content. Click create page. Behind the scenes, this is actually creating a normal uh, you know, panels panel. Uh, but rather than taking us to the page manager, it takes us straight to the page so we can start editing it in the IDE. Uh, so first, let's give it a layout, the sidebar, everybody loves a sidebar. And uh, users can click customize this page, and click this little plus guy, and get a menu of things they can add. Uh, really basic stuff, like stuff that any internet literate person would understand. So add links, add file, add an image. You know, <laughs> there's probably a hundred ways to add an image to just one arbitrary page in Drupal, and all of them are crazy complicated, right? Like if you were going to do that with blocks, you know, you have to go to like admin, structure, blocks, you have to put a block in a region, of course, you don't know where that region is, you just have the name, right? So you put it in one of those regions, you create it, put in your stuff, set up visibility rules so it only appears on this URL, click save, and then have to go all the way back to the front end to see like, did anything happen? Did that work? Uh, but in Canopoly, you know, just come here and click that image, an image. Uh, but we're going to set it up. For this presentation, I'm going to add a video. Did you guys ever consider adding like a carousel or a phone strip since they're so popular? There, there's a, a carousel widget. We call it Spotlight. Okay. It's a sort of confusing name, but I'll, I'll demo that in a moment. everywhere, 
which allows you to do uh, even the header, the footer, and the whole side layout in panels. Why do you do? Why do you still use blocks in the header and the footer? It's simple. Like I don't need anyone to change what's in the header and the footer. Like there's no reason to add the complication of panels. But like th there's is lots there, of developers like, who go is there the other a, way. A load. Like, is there a difference in terms of performance between panels and blocks? I mean, is that one of your I think there's probably a difference in performance. Blocks are super simple. Panels have all these other features and stuff. Um, the blocks do a lot of weird stuff. They're always loaded no matter what. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not good with a on page. So in practice, it becomes meaningless. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like with the header and the footer, I kind of do want oh, them to appear always. There's, there's a lot of approaches. Like the guys at um, Kalamuna who do a lot of Monopoly stuff. They have a monopoly theme, a base theme called Kala theme, and they actually advocate creating the header and the footer entirely in the theme in HTML, um, rather than using the block system or uh, panels. Open Atrium, which is based on monopoly, takes a different approach. Uh, they create a mini panel, which is like a panel that can contain other panels, um, and uh, use the theme to inject that in the header and the footer. Uh, so it's still in panels, but doesn't require panels everywhere. I don't know, there's, there's a lot of different approaches for doing the header and the footer. I don't but think there's really one. For you, I guess I'm still not understanding, like, why would you pick a block in the header and footer over a panel? Is it, is it um, performance? Is it it's just simple. security? Is it so implementation is easier? Yeah. And that's I mean, basically it? Basically, for me. But like I'm saying, if there's, there isn't one right answer to that question. Um, and that's just me, right? Like, there's lots of other people who build production sites. Well, I don't know any of those because I'm so totally new at this. So I'm just asking because I'm trying to get an understanding of, like, what are the pros and cons of using mm -hmm. one over the other? I, I kind of think the idea is that for the header and the footer, you expect those to be consistent across the entire website. And the, the panoply is, uh, uh, but the, the, the rest of the page on the website, you might want a different layout for one page versus another, and then panoply gives you a quick way of varying the layout everywhere except on the header and footer. But for the header and footer, since it's consistent across the website, it's kind of simple to set that up and segregate it from the panel's magic by, by using the blocks. But if you put a panel in the header and the footer and made it reusable across all your pages, when it, or yeah, your notes, it's, what it's, it's, it's the same difference. Like I said, lots of people do it that way. And I just have my personal preference. Yeah. No, I'm, so, I, I mean, I'm sorry. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm questioning your decision. I'm really just trying to understand like what pros and cons are like there's mm -hmm. got to be a benefit and that's why you choose one over the other and so is it as a developer it's just easier for a developer to it's, use? it's easier I don't have to enable any additional modules or do anything special like if I want to do panels everywhere to do it I have to install panels everywhere if I want to do it with a mini panel I'd have to code that up if I want to do it with a theme I have to edit my theme I don't know so okay. path of least resistance mm -hmm. <laughs> well that's good um, Question and comment to that. Does panels everywhere work pretty well with Panoply? I uh, it will work with Panoply. If okay. you find problems, it's bug. You can tell us an issue here. Um, it just doesn't seem to be the most common approach. Yeah. Like the the bigger the biggest distributions based on Panoply don't use it. Sure. And we support it. Sure. But so uh, to this question here, I do it I do it all all different ways. But you know I could uh, code my header footer in a template and then use. Panoply or panels for all the content section, um, but then I get the request from the client that they want to be able to change this or that in the header. Well, they don't know how to edit template code, so now it's kind of not so great. Um, so where uh, another solution then is to use panels everywhere and build the header and footer in panel system, which is easier and quicker for you to, to change. Right, because you can click in and oh, move this thing over here, or change the style, or add a new piece of content into that header pane. That works. Um, I like the idea of just creating a header region. You know, there's kind of a faux panels everywhere because your 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 site owners always want to do the things that you don't think they're ever going to want to do. <laughs> Yeah, like put an image that only appears on one page yeah. in one spot. Uh, I mean, the big win with panels everywhere is that you can have a completely different page template for some other page. You know, complete new design for a landing page. So, in the, the content page is the thing that those buttons customize this page and change this layout. Or it's changing, right? Um, well, there, so in this case, uh, this page, like, 
it doesn't tell you anywhere, but this is a panel, and so we're editing this panel. Uh, you can also do this on node view pages. Uh, the panelizer module allows you to make node output come through panels. So like this is a landing page, but we could also be doing this on a content page and moving around all of the information there. Okay. Did, was that your question? Uh, I'm just wondering where those where you get those buttons and where you don't get those buttons. So it's up to the person who builds the site or build the distribution. Um, you can put them, uh, there's a lot of places you can put them. Um, so it's if you created a content type for your client and you didn't want them to be able to customize it, you would not enable the IPE for that content type. Or if you want to create a you know static panels page somewhere that you created and you don't want them to touch it, you could disable them being able to use the IPE. Okay, thanks. Uh, so to the question earlier about reusable, um, now if I go to here, we'll have this reusable content tab. And if I add that, it starts out with all of the settings that I had previously. So I've created this uh, reusable widget. And this is something for your users. This is something your users can do use to create reusable widgets and put it around. You wouldn't do that, right, as the site builder or the developer. This is uh, for them. So this is something you need to Panoply with panels? Yes, it's, it's, um, so Panoply actually doesn't do a whole lot of stuff on its own. It's mostly pulling in like the best of Contrib and then configuring it in a certain way. So this reusable stuff comes from some panels edition somewhere I can't recall. But if you were just using like, um, the Drupal core setup, would you have that same function right here? No, uh, blocks in Drupal core can only be placed one time. Uh, so, you would not. I, I mean, I guess you use like beans. Is there a reusable thing in beans? Do you know I don't use beans? If you, made, if you made a bean, could you like reuse it? Yeah, I think you can. So, well, anyway. on, on the campsite, we, we actually implemented that uh, beans are referenced by the home page, so they're actually a field. Not, it's not a block in a region, it's a block that's been referenced as a field. That's not a That's what I It's a block. <laughs> it's a, a model that extends blocks to human. Because out, out of the box, Drupal 7 did not do that. Uh, blocks don't be placed on So, yeah, my, on my demo homepage here, I actually don't want a video. I'll do a. Um, I'll do a slider, since there was a request for slider. We call it Spotlight, which is actually a really confusing name. Uh, but usability, we'll change it later. So as I'm you know, adding, configuring this, you'll see it uh, start to appear in the live preview. There's the first slide. widget is actually a view. And all of the settings you have on the left are view settings. And when you're creating a view for your users, for your clients, for your distribution, uh, you can choose which of these you want to be configurable by users on this settings page. So like, I can change this view from a fields view to a content view. And now I have the teasers, switch them to full node view, switch back to fields, and say, you know, I don't want that stuff. Add the image back, that looks nice. Uh, say we want four items instead of three. This content type select box, that is actually the exposed filter on this view. So anything you put to the exposed filter on your view that you're creating as a widget for people to reuse will appear there. So this is already kind of starting to look like a site front page, and we just you know mess around for a couple of minutes. And yeah, like I was saying, 
earlier, um, this, is, this is a panel, so we get just this save and cancel button. If you were editing a node, you would get a save as custom and a save for all nodes of this type button. So you could rearrange just a single node on the entire site and do something weird there, which clients always ask for, even though it's a terrible idea. <laughs> or uh, you could move, rearrange it and have it affect all the content. Yeah, actually, for one kind of project, we used Monopoly, and a lot of our conversations were about the need to lock it down because, <laughs> because the, our designer especially was afraid that they were, that the client, if he gave them that much power, was mm -hmm. just going to do a bunch of stupid things. <laughs> well, the, the great thing is that um, you can control who has access to the IP by just normal permissions and roles, right? Mm -hmm. So you could say that the site manager can mess with this, but not like normal users would right now. Or you could give it to users with an account because you can just select just a safe palette of things that you allow them to do, and they can use it to create like uh, their personal dashboard or something. You know, they can throw like a weather widget and thing over here, whatever they want, configure it to their heart's content. Um, and to the design question, um, pain locking is another cool piece of that. Pain locking? Yeah, you lock a pain um, in, in one place. I don't think I've ever used that functionality. Oh, really? It must be one of the giant things on the gear icon in the page manager. Yeah, that I yeah so like if you <laughs> want your slideshow to always be at the top, but they can move other stuff underneath it. You could lock the slideshow, and they can move the other pieces. Sweet, sweet. Yeah, cause we're using the IP for everything in here because that's the experience we want users and site managers to have. But if you, you know, God forbid, want to use the page manager, you still can to access, you know, some of the advanced stuff like locking panes, and visibility rules, you can get and variants. Uh, I've seen Ernold do it through the IDE as well. Uh, we don't have a context enabled. I think that might be how you get there. No. But it, 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 I don't know the magic incant incantation on Mount Merlin. Um, so to, to the design question, uh, each paint also gets this little uh, paintbrush guide to choose what style you want the paint to have. Uh, these three options come from the Panoply demo module. They all look terrible. Uh, but the idea is that you provide a palette of style things that your users can use in a custom module, in your theme. There's even a way, like if you can't write code, to stylize a module will let you create these styles uh, just through a point-click interface. But the point is, you provide them with a palette of things they can do so they feel good, they have some control, but it's only a set of things that you know will look good in the design of your site, or for your distribution, or you know, for your theme, however you want to do it. And yeah, remember, um, you know, Panopoly is a blank slate. It's a base. So all of this stuff is just basic internet stuff, like map, table, uh, you know, things that you want like out of the box. But for your users, for your clients, for your distribution, you can put whatever you want in there. Things that you know they will need. Um, like if you're making a distribution for musician websites, you have a add a discography button or add an audio player button. So this is a tool also for you to create really cool things in here that your clients can use. And most of the things are uh, fieldable panel panes or views. And you can take you know, all that stuff and throw it into a feature. Uh, yeah, let's return to the slides. So, Monopoly guides distribution development. I think you know it's cool as a blank slate as a better starter, but I think it really, really shines for making your own distribution. If you want to do that, Panoply has got you. You know, low-level stuff like uh, how to do your make file, best practices, how to handle demo data, uh, all that stuff at the low level. But I think the more important thing is the higher level. It provides a framework for you to create custom specialized things for your client or your distribution and then allow the user to customize it further in a safe way with this type of UX. So let's do a really quick thought exercise. Uh, this screenshot comes from Open Academy, which is a distribution for creating university department websites. They have a content type called course. as fields like name, course number, number of credits, when it happens, it's like Monday, Wednesday at 9. So users can create courses, and then they provide 
this uh, course view where they can see a list of all the courses. So Open Academy is actually based on Panoply, but forget that for the moment. Pretend that this is a standard Drupal site. If someone downloaded this distribution, built their university department website, and said, hey, I want to put some text up there that says like, or if you want to audit all of our courses, you know, contact this person via email. How would you add that to a standard Drupal site? And then you're, you would that yeah, you could edit the view and then add uh, some custom text to the header area. That assumes, first of all, that the user knows that this is a view, knows you know, what that means and how to get to the edit page, once they get there, knows how to work with it. It's a kind of specialized system. It's got its own set of terms, its own interface, and then you know adds that there. But it's doable, right? Like they can do it. What if instead they want to add a video there, you know, or is showing their students like smiling and thumbs up and hey, you can take your You know, it really starts to break down pretty quickly. So rather than providing this as a view page, provide it as a view content page. And you know, with whatever settings you need, and then uh, make this be a, a panel page, so the user can in Panoply come click, customize this page, and throw whatever the hell they want in there. You know, if they want to remove a column from this table, let's just click the settings thing. You know, they've got the list of the fields. Uncheck it. You know, so you are creating very specific, single-purpose things for your clients, for your users, for the users of your distribution, and Panoply. Is a, if you fit it into the Panoply framework, there's a way for them to customize it. And as a site builder, you can create those things, just as views, as viewable panel panes. But even as a developer, if you're creating something entirely custom, rather than making that be a page callback, you know, make that be a, a content pane and views. Have your custom code spit whatever it needs to spit out. Uh, you can provide your own settings page, which comes when they click on that same beater you know, they don't have to dig around in the admin for wherever you put the settings. They deal with every piece of content as if it were the same thing. Doesn't matter if it's a view or a custom code or a feelable panel pane or whatever. You know, it's this usability framework for your, the users of your specific thing to customize it. So that's the most advanced use case, I guess, building distribution. Um, here are some distributions built on Panoply. Uh, some of these we talked about earlier. Um, and actually, I should give the, the side since Brent went his round. Uh, Demo Framework actually only uses a component or two from Panoply, not the, not the whole thing. But that's a total, totally valid use of Panoply. Uh, Open Church for building church websites. Restaurant for building restaurant websites. Push Tape for musician websites. Uh, although their public release still is in Panoply, their gig is though. Um, MVP Creator, it's a pet project of mine for building startup MVPs. Um, these two end examples are kind of interesting. Uh, the Canadian government created an internal distribution to bank all of their websites and then released it open source. I have no idea if it's actually useful for anyone who isn't the Canadian government. <laughs> uh, you know, same for the Arizona State one. But it's really cool to have those examples uh, to look at, to see what they did. You know, if you want to create your own internal distribution. Uh, so yeah, I had a section at the end which was advanced developer stuff, the basics of actually starting to create your panoply based distribution, but this is a beginnery session, so uh, we'll skip over that. If you're interested in it, um, you know, come talk to me later or grab that URL, it's the panoply documentation on how to create the distribution. The slides, by the way, are posted on the Midcamp site, so if you want any of my links, just you know, grab the slides and you can get them. A couple of shout outs right at the end. Uh, the lead maintainer, the original creator of Panoply is Matt Cheney, also co-founder of Pantheon Systems, who I'm supposed to announce is paying for drinks at the after party. So everyone come to the after party, free drinks. Or Pantheon. Uh, the other co-maintainer, Tom Kirkpatrick, co-founder of uh, System Seed, also maintainer of Open Academy. So you know, it's not just, not just me, we've got some, some other wizards. Um, and we're a really active community project, yeah? Can you use Panoply with Pantheon? Absolutely. Yeah, you yeah. can go to create a new site, you'll get like a list of what you want to start with, you just click Panoply. Um, 
We have a great community uh, contributing patches, reviewing patches, posting bugs, all that stuff. As maintainers, me, Matt, and Tom, we're mostly you know taking the great work from the community and integrating it into the product. Uh, so you know, come come join us, help us uh, make it better. Oh, and I stole a lot of pictures from Matt Chang's presentation. Which we're not totally. So, how do we get your slides? Uh, on the Midcamp website. If you oh. go to my session, there'll be a link to uh, this on Google Docs also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.